morning, afternoon, and evening. We're going to begin for the day. Um, it is unsurprising that hosting the March meetings online would mean facilitating discussions across different time zones. <laughs> so our panelists today are joining us uh, from 6 a.m. Pacific time through to 6 p.m. Gulf Standard Time. And I would like to begin by wishing them, uh, everyone participating from their homes today, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Aisha Stobi, and I'm very privileged to be moderating today's panel. To very briefly introduce myself, I'm a curator and researcher with a broad interest in modern art from the global south. I completed my PhD research at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, where I now teach. My thesis focused on modern arts and modernism from the Khadij or the Arabian Peninsula from the early 20th century until around the period that we're going to be discussing today. I would like to uh, introduce our panel in the context of its impact. The last two decades, in particular narratives and developments of art movements in the region, cannot be separated from the form and developments of the biennial in Sharjah and the ecosystems which surrounded Sharjah. And the March meetings 2021 are now in their 12th edition. And as Hur al Qasimi remarked yesterday in her opening address, this collection of discussions was conceived by the late Okwian Wezor as a reflection of Sharjah itself, a space to consider the idea of a global art world, a truly global art world, mirroring the Sharjah Biennial as offering a critical alternative to old entrenched institutional thought. These roundtables, yesterday and today, have been conceived as a tripartite series representing three stages of the Sharjah Biennial. Yesterday, our colleagues in the first two panels reflected on the first two stages of that history, and we thank them for their important contributions to the Biennial, for critically reflecting on their contributions, and for the historic roles that many of them have played within regional and global artistic ecologies. Panel one examined the significant establishment and evolution of the Biennial from its inception in 1993 to the launch of its new approach to 2003, examining the spaces and interactions regionally and globally, which the biennial helped facilitate. In panel two, Okwi's 2002 documenta was mentioned as a turning point. Hul Qasimi talked about the traditional difficulties of national representations and wanting to challenge these existing regional models through what Peter Lewis and Tor Qasimi termed as motivations rather than a plan, they examined new models for the biennial. And yesterday's discussions focused on the three editions of the Sharjah Biennial held after 2003, when the biennial emerged as a curated exhibition with an overarching theme and accompanying collateral events. The third and final panel of this series is now today, and our panel will focus on the most recent biennials and the increasingly experimental and challenging formats which they enact. Starting with Yoko Haskawa's integrations of multiple new spaces in 2013's 11th Sharjah Biennial re-emerge towards a new cultural cartography under the structure of the courtyard as a meeting place. We have two artists with us today who participated in that biennial, John Akomfra and uh, Mina Mania, who will speak about the context of their work and their ongoing relationships and experiences with Sharjah and with the Biennial. We have the great pleasure of also discussing Unji Ju's progressive and dynamic structures, investigating ideas of time and space in 2015 Sharjah Biennial 12, the past, the present, the possible, and ways she thought about the city in relationship to the Biennial. It is important to mention Christine Tohme's 2017 Biennial, Tamawaj, with its multiple platforms across different geographies. And I should mention uh, that both Yuko and Christine will be participating in the March meetings as well in the coming days. So please make sure to review uh, the upcoming program and to see their talks as well. We will conclude with Omar Khulif's longstanding relationship to Sharjah and his contribution, making new time to the tripartite leaving the echo chamber in 2019 which was curated alongside Zoe Butt and Claire Tankens. And we are very fortunate to have Otto Bong and Gawa 
today, with us today, whose work was in that biennial as well. She has a similarly long-standing relationship to Sharjah. Um, and this panel today will also reflect on some of those ongoing conversations. As the panelists speak today, I would like us all to reflect on time and on context and the influence these partic this participations have had. The rethinking of existing models, not just in the region, but much further afield, particularly in rethinking contemporary global art events, re-examining threads of multiple histories, employing a range of structures in much longer and wider reaching programs and discussions, and developing varied representational models enacting a range of non-traditional spaces and arenas. Before we begin our questions and presentations for the day, I want to just introduce each speaker, uh, our esteemed panelists, and the order in which they'll speak. Uh, beginning with Unji Ju, who is Curator of Contemporary Art at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the SF MoMA, uh, from 2017 to present. And she was also Curator of the Shadja Biennial 12, as I mentioned, the past, present, and the possible in 2015. At San Francisco MoMA, uh, Unji organized the group exhibition Soft Power from 2019 to last year, 2020, which looked at the role of artists and citizens as social actors. Other curatorial projects include acting as artistic director for the fifth Anyang Public Art Project in South Korea, co-curator of the Ungovernables at the New Museum in New York in 2012, commissioner of the Korean Pavilion at the 53rd Venice Biennial, advisor for Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh, and founding director and curator of the Roy and Edna Disney Cal Arts Theater, uh, also known as Red Cat, in Los Angeles from 2003 to 2007, where she developed residencies and exhibitions with Superflex, Damian Ortega, Sorek, and, and Kara Walker, among others. Uh, the list is extensive, so uh, I will pause it there. Um, she has also published extensively as the recipient of the Walter Hobbs Curatorial Award for Achievement uh, from the Mental Collection in 2006. And uh, she has her PhD from the Department of Ethnic Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. In addition to the biennial, she has a longstanding relationship to Sharjah and has been a frequent collaborator, being present in the region for the past decade. She contributed to the March meetings in 2012, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2018, and now in 2021. Um, Amina, Amina Menya is interested in many very fascinating research topics, um, including architecture as an archeology span of the culture and history of a city, as well as what she terms the symbolic territory for the frenzies of men and their desire for power. Uh, recently, she's extended her research from heritage to more contemporary political and post-colonial topics. She creates installations and sculptures that investigate these relationships between historical memory, urban space and architecture. Her work has been exhibited both nationally and internationally, including in Dublin, Ireland at the Royal Hibernian Academy, the National Museum of Qatar in Tunisia, Corner House in Manchester in 2011, the Musée National d'Art Moderne in Algiers, and Ponte Verde, Ponte Pedra Biennial in Spain in 2008. Uh, she graduated from the École Supérieure de Beaux Arts de Algiers. Um, she was born there, and that's where she continues to live and work. In addition to participating in Shadja Biennial 11, which she'll speak about today in her various projects, uh, she, like the other panelists, has a long standing history of collaborating with Sharjah and was also involved in Do It Balarabi. Uh, John Akomfra, his work is characterized by investigations into memory, post colonialism, temporality, and aesthetics, and he often explores experiences of migrant diasporas globally. His work has been screened and exhibited at a large number of institutions. A small selection of these include the ICA in Boston, the Imperial War Museum in London, the New Museum in New York, um, the San Francisco MoMA, the Barbican in London, the Triennial of Milan, uh, the 56th Venice Biennial, the Shadja Biennial, of course, um, in 2013, the Taipei Biennial, and the ICA in London. Serpentine, Documenta 11, again, I, I, I will stop there as the list goes on. 
He's a founding member of the very influential Black Audio Film Collective um, from 1982 to 1999, and its offshoot, the film and television production company, Smoking Dog Films, from 1998 to present. Um, John has received numerous awards and honors, including the British Film Institute's John Grierson Award for Documentary in 1987. And in 2017, he was appointed commander of the Order of the British Empire. Uh, he was born in Ghana. He's currently based in London. And in addition to participating in Sharja, the Sharjah Biennial, the 11th one, he's also going to be working in the Sharjah Biennial, the 15th one, which is very, very exciting. He's previously participated in the March meetings in 2018, and we're very happy to have him with us here again today. Um, Omar Khuleyf, he is a Royal Fellow of the Royal, he is, sorry, a Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, uh, a writer, a curator of exhibitions, special projects and global commissions, and a cultural historian. For Khuleyf, the heart of his work is a mission to change the way that people see and engage with hidden histories in an era of fast paced social and economic change and hypermediated technological evolution. He's currently director of collections and senior curator at the Sharjah Art Foundation, where he oversees collection strategy, development and acquisitions, um, as well as attendant exhibition publishing and discursive opportunities. Before joining the foundation, he was the Manolo Senior Curator and Director of Global Initiatives at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. He was also Curator at the Whitechapel Gallery in London and Senior Curator at Corner House in Home, Manchester. He has served as an Artistic Director and Consultant for numerous international film festivals. And selected curatorial projects include the very recent Age of Age, Arts in the Age of Anxiety at Shadja Art Foundation last year, Time Forward, um, VA, from the VAC Art Foundation and the 58th Venice Biennial in 2019 and the Sharjah Biennial 14, Leaving the Echo Chamber, which we'll speak about today. He's an author, he's an academic. He served as visiting tutor at the Ruskin School of Art in Oxford. Um, and he taught at a number of other universities. He holds his MA from the University of Glasgow and the Royal College of Arts as well. And he has a PhD from the University of Reading and Zurich University of the Arts. In addition to being one of three curators alongside Zoe Butt and Claire Tankons for Shadja Biennial 14, he's been a regional contributor, previously participating in the March meetings in 2012, 2013, and 2019, and in several other ways, which he'll speak with us about uh, during today's panel. And finally, um, Otto Bong and Kanga, who works across a broad spectrum of mediums, including performance, installation, photography, drawing, and sculpture in order to explore ideas surrounding land and natural resources. She sometimes serves as the protagonist in her performances, videos and photographs acting as a catalyst that sets the artistic process in motion. A very brief selection of her solo exhibitions include To Dig a Hole That Collapses Again at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, um, Wet in You Go Do at the Tanks at Tate Modern in London in 2017, the Encounter That Took a Part of Me at Nottingham Contemporary in 2016 in the UK. Dias Diopatasia, <laughs> I hope I said that properly, at uh, Tate Modern in London in 2015, as well as Document of 14 in Castle and in Athens in 2017. She's also participated in numerous biennials, including the 11th Guangzhou Biennial, the 20th Sydney Biennial, the Biennial of Lyon in number 13, the Berlin Biennial 8, Ashkel Elwan in Beirut, and of course, Shadja Biennial 11 in 2012 and Shadja Biennial 7 in 2008, among others. Um, her past participations also have been varied and extensive. So as with all the other panelists, we look forward to talking about how a relationship to Shadja is something that is always ongoing and always varied and multifaceted. I'd like to mention to everyone a bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, so there is Arabic interpretation uh, for those of you who haven't seen in the chat, the instructions and the audience can select the language in the box at the right of the screen. You can also share questions via the eventive chat function throughout the session 
And at the end of this panel, we will make sure that we provide dedicated time to the question and answers. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but please do try to keep the questions relevant as we'll prioritize those that are most pertinent to the discussions. Um, so without any further ado, I would like to begin by uh, introducing Yunji with my first questions for the day. Um, so Yunji, I have a quote from you, um, which I would like to read. Quote, it comes from a sentence in The Right to the City by Henri Lefebvre. The past, the present, the possible cannot be separated, end quote. But the idea for the biennial came before I read this essay. It just matched the sentiment well. What Lefebvre is writing about in his approach to the city is very much related to what contemporary artists are thinking about right now. There is some kind of crossover in the way he puts everything in the present. One of the things that I thought about, not only for Sharjah, but for the greater region usually called the Middle East and for the world, is how we deal with history. How do we respect history? even share information about it without being burdened by history where we can't move. Uh, Yunji, I'd like to ask you to reflect on the thinking of the right to the city in the context of that quotation and your theme in the biennial and the process which led you to choosing this theme in relation to Sharjah. First off, mute. Thank you so much. I, first, I want to say it's such a pleasure and an honor to participate in the March meeting again. A little embarrassing, maybe I'm taking up too much March meeting time over the last decade, but um, it's great to see you all because you know we've norm we would normally be together in the under the warm sun and um, and I feel it. You know, I feel you all here together. So thank you. You know, in in Sharjah, I think many of us have been fortunate, many of us here today have been really fortunate to witness something happening in Sharjah, you know, uh, not, not only in the art foundation, which of course we have seen incredible, like, you know, development and maturity and complexity over the last uh, uh, 15 years that who has been really involved, almost 20, I guess now, um, but also in the city itself and the way in which migration has come to affect the city. And I think I told you before, Aisha, when I first came to Sharjah, I had this feeling that maybe this is what California looked like in the early 1900s, you know, with all these people sacrificing at great, you know, against great odds um, to provide for their families many, many miles away, you know, often, uh, uh, often not seeing them for years at a time or, or something like this. And, and, you know, everybody here knows that, you know, a taxi driver in Sharjah maybe hasn't seen their family for three years, five years, or, you know, it's, it's a, it's a kind of sacrifice that is um, historic, you know, it, it's a kind of, it's a kind of story that many of us as, as immigrants or migrants to other lands uh, have experienced in different generations um, through our, through our family lines. And so I think there's something of that that moves you in, in Sharjah. At the same time, it's it has an archaeological presence. You know, you feel geologic time in Sharjah. You go into the desert and you see um, you see shells, seashells. You know, and then you realize that you're standing in the sea of another time, and and that really changes your way of thinking. And so you are suddenly quite aware of the um, the your your insignificance. And I think it's very important, you know, to, to experience this kind of um, really, uh, you know, to, to see yourself in nature and to see yourself in perspective. And that's why I, I wanted to think about Sharjah as a developing city and this biennial as a developing biennial simultaneously and, and bring to the table um, some of the practitioners that I had unique contact to perhaps differently than curators of other biennials, other editions, um, so that we could learn this place and investigate this place and invest in this place together and that we would kind of expand the, the, um, the number of people who are invested in this, uh, this art community. 
um, from that perspective, from the perspective of Sharjah itself. So, you know, not a kind of mercenary approach of dropping in, but thinking that all of us as practitioners could contribute to the development of this, um, of Sharjah. Um, and I'd also thank you, thank you very much for that. And I that analogy actually stayed with me. This idea of, of multiple people building a narrative and building a city, and that comparison to California, which I, I think is very apt. Um, and on, on that same theme, thinking about the theme of the biennial, thinking about um, Shadja as a, as a changing city with multiple contributors, I'd like to ask you to reflect on the thinking. Um, on your experience of the multiple structures of the research process, because I know that you, you made a, a big effort to integrate the city into your research uh, process. The March meetings and the biennial itself um, were both organized uh, by you during that time. Um, and I'd like, if possible, if you could tell us a bit how archeology, span heritage and timelessness played a part in your practice and process inspired by Sharjah for that biennial and thereafter? You know, I, I was fortunate enough to, to be able to come to Sharjah for the, for the March meetings first. And, and I think in that way, and learn about the March meeting from artists uh, who had participated in the March meeting for a long time and, you know, really been told how important it was. And so, um, so I was able to attend a few before I was uh, making a proposal for the biennial. And so I saw its significance, its importance. And I really wanted to use the platform in order to, like I said, engage artists in this conversation. And, and also to, um, to allow the public to have an interface with the artist. And so that was part of the idea, but in the, in the process of, of, you know, this kind of maybe, maybe outside implant of an idea of we're going to bring people, we're going to do public programs. I have been doing uh, public programs in uh, at the New Museum in New York for some years. So, you know, to try to engage in the discursive practice at the same time, this might have been something I just brought in. But once I came to Sharjah to, to begin to develop the project, you know, for one in the Sharjah that John participated in, Superflex did this incredible job of, of developing a public park, the bank, and bridging, you know, the, the, the biennial to the city in a way that I'm sure there have been instances in the past, but was quite unique because, because people are out in, in public late at night, you know, to have a place of meeting that is actually completely um, um, offered by the Art Foundation and open to the public, you know, it, it did something else. And so that was one thing that really, I think, inspired my biennial. Um, the other was driving with Hoor out towards the, um, towards the university and, and seeing something and asking her what it was and her telling me that it was an archeological site and she hadn't been there and maybe we could go. And, and soon thereafter, we visited this site and learned from, um, I see Yusuf, who's part of the Directorate of Archaeology, that there were in fact many sites and that there had been very recent um, discoveries uh, that, that extended our, our understanding of uh, the presence of mankind in Sharjah. For example, you know, as many of you know, that there has been sign of like um, uh, mankind uh, and, and cities, you know, it, or established communities in the Sharjah area for 5,000 years. And in fact, evidence of mankind for 125,000 years in Leha. So the presence and, and who was there and how we define it, it, it goes for a long time. You know, it, it changes. Any of us could be the, uh, could have some kind of connection through our bloodlines to this place. You know, it, it establishes, the uh, Arabian route from Africa. So it's a, it's a kind of amazing um, knowledge to start to ponder. And so when we started to develop um, um, residency programs uh, and, and think about bringing artists to do research, immediately this long history became part of what we were thinking about. And, and I should say also, from my abil my um, chance to visit previous biennials, I also knew what the what the foundation was capable of, and and this led me to 
to decide to try to bring as many new commissions to the project as possible. And so we, from the outset, had the ambition to make at least 35 new commissions, which is crazy, right? And also to, to occupy many of the new spaces, even though Yuko had access to the new spaces, some of them weren't quite complete by that time, or artists might not have had the full range of selection over those spaces because they were being developed simultaneous to to the previous biennial. So we had these completed spaces or, or abandoned courtyards or, you know, these kind of more, more fixed spaces to occupy. And so there was something to push off from. And so this became a very important part of, of what we could do there. And, and so I think bringing the artist to Sharjah over a year in advance of, of the biennial was a key part of what we wanted to do. We wanted to also incorporate, you saw, um, uh, I'm forgetting his name, the, from the uh, planning commission. So we learned about the, the port of Sharjah. We learned about the history of the architecture together as in groups um, surrounding the March meeting. So in research groups, uh, starting a week before the, the March meeting in 2014, to a week after we visited petroglyphs and together we, uh, many participated, here's Christine Tome and um, Ahmed Hussein. We also invited people who were important to our thinking and, and artists presented their works to each other. And I think this created a sense of community that people had to answer to each other over a period of time and, and maybe it grew a bond between people. Yes, ab absolutely. And I think community is also something really important to, to mention because I, I know um, as, as soon as we started the session today, there was this immediate sense of, uh, of continuity of discussions and of a global community that emerged out of these events. Um, and, and thank you also for bringing up some of the, the thinking surrounding the multiple use of spaces. Um, which is something very important, I think, for us to think about in the context of today's sessions. Um, so ways in which this stage of the biennial started to rethink um, the scope of the biennial and the different spaces which could be enacted. Um, I'd like to also ask you, Unji, um, we had some brief discussions on multiculturalism within Shadja. Um, and you just mentioned as well some of these various threads and the diversity of the art foundation, um, both thinking of it in terms of migration and thinking of it in terms of different ethnicities, but also thematically and as a multi-layered platform. Um, could I ask you to reflect on, on your biennial, on this multicultural idea of, of the city, uh, placing ourselves in the present moment and particularly now, um, that you're working at an institution in the United States during what is a, a very volatile moment? Well, I've, I mean, I think one could argue that the United States is a volatile moment as it's in and of itself. You know, um, um, I think one of the things we wanted to establish in Sarja Biennial 12 was the possibility of rereading history through the present. I think that's one of the things that we're talking about here. And um, sorry, there's some, now the trucks are coming to my street. Um, um, in, in rethinking the, the, the present, we, one of the things that I wanted to, to mention that I forgot to tell you about before when you bring up this idea of multiculturalism or, or maybe many influences from different places, was a thread around um, the radical language of abstraction. And one area that I wanted to just bring up was that we had these kind of historic figures that, that we included, including um, um, Sawa Raudu Shaker, uh, Fernanisa Said, um, work by Atel Adnan, work by Chung Chung Sap. Um, and, and this was to establish that um, within art history, we've been separated from many influences that, that may have uh, uh, been important and that 
if in fact we wanted to rewrite history, one of the things is that we could re-choose those who influenced us. We could just make up a history. So, you know, like suddenly we could make a connection between places and times that had, you know, there was no proof that there was a direct influence, but that we could kind of rechart. Um, and this is just a kind of metaphor for everything else. You know, it's to say that we could rechart the past as we can rechart the future. So I think that that was something, you know, as we have this kind of um, terrible violence that that the U.S. was participate is and was participating in in the so-called region. Um, we wanted to bring I wanted to bring people who were invested in the region in ways that we might not always see. So, for example, there were many artists of Korean descent because I have particular access to them, um, but many people don't know of the impact of um, Korean labor in the region because so many Korean um, workers came to uh, to participate in the building of the, the oil infrastructure like their physical labor was um, used because this is a really poor country at the time in post-war Korea where you know in order to um, in order to get uh, in, get get uh, foreign bids for construction because construction became a very important business in Korea. They you know sent their their uh, men for these very dangerous jobs. You know they put the lowest bid in because they needed the money so badly. And so there were many Korean workers. And so I wanted to bring Korean artists who had an understanding and connection to that history, you know, back to a place that they had couldn't even imagine. And I think I talked to you a little bit about this. I said that, you know, for for also for um, for artists based in the United States, whose country is so invested in the so-called region, so um, benefiting, you know, from from the, the, these various industries in the region, but also participating um, in kind of military disorder in the in the region, we can't even picture that place from here. It is an unoccupied place, you know? And so for those reasons, it was also very important to bring many artists from the United States um, so that they could have an understanding, um, bring something to the place, but also take something with them away from the experience. Um, thank you so much. And and I think that's um, a, a very apt moment to, to address my next question to John. Um, who I would like, uh, if possible, if you can introduce to us now a work um, called Unfinished Conversation, um, which I, I hope everyone is familiar with. Uh, it's, it's been viewed in more than one form, um, and it's, it's focusing on Stuart Hall, who's a very, very important cultural figure um, for, for the Caribbean of course, but more broadly than that, um, for the global South and for Europe, he's, he's someone who really rethinks identity in many ways. Um, I'd like to ask you, John, if you could tell us why you chose to focus on Stuart Hall um, when creating this project, um, why you chose to dedicate uh, this project to him, and also uh, how it related to themes of Shadja Biennial 11. Um, so thinking of Stuart Hall's legacy in that context and that work in the context of Sharja, both thematically and spatially as well. Um, Aisha, thank you so much for this incredible work of trying to pull the strands, the multiple strands that we embody and represent together in this way. It's really quite heartening. Um, I, I don't, I mean, there's, there's a Caribbean writer who I love, uh, a lot who died recently, Wilson Harris. And Wilson Harris talks a lot about what he calls the, un the infinite rehearsal, the ways in which things continuously seem as if they're going around the same corners of being over and over again, each time picking up nuance and so on, you know. Um, when I think about Stuart uh, uh, and I think about his connections to me, it feels a little bit like a kind of infinite wrestle, you know, um, in the sense that he was there in the very beginnings of, of our attempt uh, by we, by our, I mean the collective that I worked as part of 
uh, for most of the 80s and 90s. Um, he was there as when we try to grapple with what it means and how one could make transitions from performance work to moving image work, you know. Um, uh, we had started making a film called Handsworth Songs, um, which itself had been a result of multiple kind of tributaries of research that we were doing pretty much uh, for most of the early 80s. And, and had decided, uh, especially once a set of kind of uh, riots or unrests took place in, in, in Britain in the mid eighties, that this will be the time to, to unearth that research as part of this project. Um, and we'd worked on it for about seven months um, and wanted just to, to run it past people, you know? Um, and the first person who came to mind was, was Stuart for, for all sorts of very complicated reasons. Now, Stuart Hall, uh, yes, is a figure from the Caribbean. Um, he uh, came to England at the age of 19 to study at Oxford um, in 1952, and he died here, uh, you know, um, 2014. Um, Everything that um, I became feels strangely connected to this man because his early work was all about uh, the emerging post-migrant communities of five, six-year-olds um, who were growing up in England, really as the first demographic group of post-migrant children to have grown up in, 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 a, in a European city as a mass, not individuals, but as a mass, as a generation. Um, he started his work uh, in the 60s around that. That's me. <laughs> I'm part of that group he's talking about, you know. Um, in the mid 70s, he was part of a group that did probably the most far reaching, far -reaching uh, research into policing in Britain. Um, and it was published in 78, 79 as Police in the Crisis. Police in the Crisis looked at the emergence in the early 70s of particular kinds of policing strategies that targeted black youth, young black teenagers, as a sort of focus of its attention. Um, and at the time, 76, 77, he was talking about 17, 18 year olds. That's me. <laughs> I was having to take it at the time, you know. So there's a way in which his, his work had basically tracked the evolution of my generation. Um, and so it was fitting that, that at some point when we wanted to do a project which was based in Birmingham, that we would turn to him. He, as it so happens, had been in Birmingham where the riots took place that the film is about. He had been in Birmingham since the mid sixties. He'd set up I'd been invited um, to, to help set up the most influential cultural studies project um, at Birmingham University, which became the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. And that center and its work pretty much spread across the planet, right? Um, and in a, in a kind of interesting way, when I went to Documentary 11, you could just feel, you could, the aura of Stuart was everywhere. <laughs> You know, um, so in many ways, the desire to do something about him um, uh, uh, starts quite a while back. Um, it took it took very concrete shape at that documenta in two thousand two, I think, um, because that documenta foregrounded lots of questions. But the main one for me was this question of historicity. You know, um, historicity not as a um, an artifact or a prop, right? But a hermeneutic, a way of understanding and working, you know, using the question of the historical as material, as form, as content, you know. Um, or quiz uh, 211, 2002 uh, document, a licensed, licensed that for us. So, um, the unfinished conversation is a self-contained piece. It's related to a second piece called the Stuart Hall Project. But the unfinished conversation 
is a self-contained triptych, which we finished uh, uh, part commissioned by the Liverpool Biennial of 2012, finished it, it was shown at that Biennial in 2012. And I think Yuko Asagawa and Sheikh Hall both saw it there. Um, we then basically got an invitation letter <laughs> from Sharjah saying, oh, by the way, there's this, we're doing this, um, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, vinyl, would you like <laughs> to, to come? I'm like, of course. <laughs> I mean, like, what is there to say no about? You know? um, I didn't quite know what I was saying yes to until I got here, but that's a, a, a much bigger conversation, which we can, we can have soon. Um, but I have to say that um, when we got here, you know, I mean, I was struck by, by, by the aura, the aura of conviviality, which was really quite remarkable, you know, um, and of fraternity, you know, um, it was, and the ways in which two things were connected, like if you walked into Ottobong's yard, what we called Ottobong's yard, where she did her performance, all manner of things were happening in there, not just their performance, conversations about all kinds of things. You know? um, I remember bumping into, you know, for the first time outside of the unfinished conversation. And she's like, hey, I saw the piece, loved it. And we've been talking like this <laughs> ever since, usually in transit as well, you know. So it had this real kind of lightness to it. Um, but it had something else which, I can go, go back to later on if you want me to. I mean, the, I think partly why uh, Stuart was important um, was because um, you could see in Documenta that he had in a way licensed what I would call a post-colonial ethics, you know, um, a way of, of, of approaching work, which meant that you could, you could take seriously questions of inscription, right? Um, and the question of inscription meant not simply saying, oh yes, we, we want to be included, write us into the, the history. No, the, it's, you know, the question of inscription also requires displacement. Questions of inscription also require dethroning because, because you have to make space for inscriptions. <laughs> you know, it's not just that, you know, people come. When, when things are inscribed into narratives, they bring with them, you know, uh, histories, narratives, which are counter hegemonic. You know, they, they challenge. You can't, you can't keep a racist institution and say to a bunch of black people, oh, come in, <laughs> and everything remains the same. It doesn't work that way. So, so the question of inscription you know, as part of a post-colonial ethics was really central for me. Um, the other thing which was absolutely critical, um, I would say is the improbable gesture, you know, uh, what I would call the improbable gesture. And for me, the improbable gesture is the, the gesture which says, look, you know, in, as improbable as it might seem, there is still more time and more space to talk about modernism <laughs> differently. As improbable as it might seem, there is still space and there's still time to reconsider what the relationship between the aesthetic, the aesthetic and the political, as improbable as that might seem. You know, there are all kinds of questions which were assumed to be answered, finished, gone, over with, et cetera, et cetera, that by gest gesture of improbability, one could reintroduce onto the canon. You know, it's one of the uh, tricks of, of, of um, Oquis Documenta that I like so much. Um, and it's, it's really something that goes to the heart of Stuart's work. You know, uh, if you think this is over, think again. There's another way in which we can look at it, you know. So those are broadly why. In fact, it wasn't really my work. We were supposed to do it together. We started talking to him from 2009, and it was going to be John O'Comfra, you know, Stuart Hall, produced by Lena Gopal and Mark Seeley from Autograph, and, and this was it. This was our attempt to think through 
what the implications of blackness might mean at the end of a, of a millennia and the beginning of a new one. You know, what can we can say about the last century and it's, you know, and he started very much saying, I think it should be around questions of identity, which of course he would, <laughs> because he's, he's done a lot to, to shape the ways in which we understand identity. And the minute he started to say that he couldn't work on it collaboratively, uh, because he was just too ill. That's when I thought, actually, you're the figure. <laughs> you could be the center of this. You know, since you're not making it, then we can make it uh, using you as a convenient ruse for, for stringing everything around, especially this idea um, that he was very fond of at the time, um, uh, the idea that identities are created at these intersections of the historic and the psychic. I thought, well, I mean, you, Stuart Hall, pretty much summarized that theory and that thesis. So we'll use your life as a, as a sort of jumping off point for, for that piece. And that's how the Unfinished Conversation came about. Um, I'm just going to share a screen with some images while I ask you the next question, just mm -hmm. so that uh, people can have a visual of the work which we're, we're speaking about. Um, and, and I mentioned this to you the other day, but mm -hmm. this work uh, is, is so, it's so beautiful um, because there, there is such a universality to it. I, I remember when I, when I first spoke to you about this work, I told you that Stuart Hall's trajectory was very similar to that of my father. Yes. Um, he did the same journey and, uh, and watching it was very emotional for me. And I, I think his ideas, um, apply to so many different regional contexts. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I have cited him as, as a cultural theorist in relation to the Gulf as well. I, I don't think that it's an improbable gesture. I love that terminology. Mm -hmm. um, when we say that uh, we have to rethink modernism and the aesthetic and the political, I think in fact, it's a reality. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very interesting when, um, Often when I'm, I'm speaking with students, there's not a very huge age gap between me and uh, those in the theory classes I teach. And yet I'm aware that I'm outdated and the things that I was taught, uh, they, they think are so antiquated, um, which is very refreshing to see. Um, I, I'd like to continue speaking with you um, about this work and some of the ideas that you've just shared with us. Um, and I'd like to talk about it now in the context of those meeting points in Sharjah itself and how you felt that the themes and discussions of race and those political events, um, how they resonated in Sharjah and within the biennial, within the themes of that particular biennial. Um, again, drawing on the idea that there is this universality, both in Stuart Hall's work and of course, as you mentioned, it's, it's fascinating the way you put that, him as a figure. Mm -hmm. um, so him not just as a collaborator or a voice, but him as a, as a, as a person. I mean, in a way, um, to answer your question, I need to go back to the Liverpool Biennial. Liverpool Biennial was um, uh, curated to a theme of hospitality which was a, an idea Stuart Hall particularly hated. <laughs> he just hated that Deridian, that whole Deridian thing. Um, and I, I think it had something to do with its denial, the denial in hospitality of disavowal, you know, because um, in many ways, um, many of the spaces of hospitality, which are you know, civil society are also spaces of massive disavowal of, you know, uh, difference, you know. Um, and you only have to look at what's happening with Meghan Markle now to know that disavowal is a central trope <laughs> at, the, at the heart of the metropolis. So I understood why, why he, um, he was so um, against the, the, the theme of hospitality. I do think that he would have enjoyed um, immensely Yuko's biennial. Um, I think what he would have liked about it in particular was the notion of new cartography. Yeah, uh, was the notion of new maps for 
investigating, navigating, um, orchestrating, you know, all words that Marx are not supposed to do, I know, but <laughs> if they could do those things, <laughs> he would have loved, he would have loved that behind um, Euclid's. You know, there was something about um, the universe of um, Hall here as well, in terms of the choice of people, you know, um, and what they did, you know, it was remarkable to go round the corner and there was um, Wow Shorky's uh, uh, Koali singers, right? And, you know, uh, Koali had been something really important to, to my generation in the early 80s, um, because it was one of the things we shared with our South Asian neighbors, you know, especially the Pakistani ones. Um, it had gone slightly mainstream when Peter Gabriel and the real world record label started to put some koali out. It had slightly gone even more mainstream when Martin Scorsese used it in the last Temptation of Life. But, but to see it performed in Sharjah felt like a return. It felt like a return with weight, with force of signification, you know. Um, you know, uh, when you talked about deep time um, in her bit, and there was nothing more reassuring than watching, you know, everyday time in Yuko's. It was sort of quite remarkable, whether it was Otterbonk's piece or, or the Superflex piece. It was just amazing. It just blew your head off, you know, how this invention of space via child's playground then created this interface you know, between <laughs> an art exhibition, a biennial, and a populist, but a very particular uh, kind of populist. So many young women and their kids there, and you could tell they just normally have nowhere to go, you know? Um, so the Superflex piece not, didn't just propose a kind of statement about what art could play, what roles art could play. It proposed a statement about the use of space, you know, um, in the same way that, you know, as I said, if you went to Autobongs, but you know, the, there were so many like that, you know, um, all across the city um, for that buying. So uh, it felt like we were home. And I don't mean to sound romantic about it, not so much the space, but the group. It felt like that the, we were part of a group of kindred spirits um, who'd all been tasked with the responsibility of bringing our weirdness um, to this place. And you know what? It didn't feel so fucking weird after all, once you got here, you know? It was just extraordinary, actually. And I think that's something that, that came up in the previous panels as well, this idea of, of public space as meeting space and not just meeting space. I mean, even the space we have now, um, something entirely unique that, that has developed out of Sharjah, um, this, this opportunity to create all of these uh, connections and all of these lines of thought to merge them together. Um, thank you so much. I'll, I'll be asking you further questions later in the panel, but I'd like to, um, to address my next question to Amina um, and to similarly ask you to introduce your work in Closed, um, which was in the same Sharjah Biennial, Sharjah Biennial 11. Um, and if you can speak to us about the background of the project, similarly to discuss it in the context of the biennial thematically and spatially. I, I know there's quite a few common threads between both of your works, um, particularly in reviewing histories as well or thinking about them in different ways. Um, so this, it will be fascinating, I think, for those of us watching to also think of it as two works that were part of one conversation at the same time. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you for your beautiful introduction. And thank you. Um, I will jump on one word on Yunji's intervention, you know, archaeology that was coming back, archaeology. And uh, let me say that my work, my practice is kind of archaeology, urban archaeology. 
because you know um, I belong to a country which is highly charged with history and political you know it's very heavy in terms of political issues and uh, so it's my everyday life digging in this kind of memory history and uh, and uh, once again when I refer to the words by Unji, the past, the present, the possible, I was saying that in my context, let's say, uh, there is the past, there is the present maybe, and maybe it's not possible. So this is why you cannot and even project yourself in a certain future because the past is always here, overwhelming. And um, I remember you've been using the word uh, burdened, I think, by history. This is the region of the world, you know, we belong to those regions where history is very heavy. This is why my practice is kind of archaeology, kind of detective, because I'm always trying to get the information, dig into archive, because it's not very easy. It's not because, because, you know, the situation that you can imagine how complex can, can be. And, um, if you know, in my heart and in my practice, I'm I'm very passionate about you know time passing by. I'm really obsessed by by aging, by time that passes, and uh, this is why I always refer to architecture as a real mirror of time passing. You know, I borrow from architecture, from urban language, urban grammar, uh, everything in my practice. Uh, you know, I use scaffoldings. I use you know. A props, I mean, just like, how do we call them? Support beams, all that kind of things to to do, to make urban installations. And so this is why for me to, I mean, to understand my society, to accompany my society, the development of, of humankind also, but especially when I'm speaking about my society, is to see what happens in the architecture, in the behavior of the city, within the city, within the urban fabric. And so all those transformations are for me like a mirror to what is it unconscious, what it is layered in, 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 in my society. And uh, so if we use archaeology, let's say I'm kind of archaeologist that always try to make links between this and that. And uh, this is why my work most of the time is just like telling stories with fragments, with bits here and there. It's like writing in, in dots and um, re revealing parts of a history rather than, you know, the whole picture, the whole thing. Um, and this is what, how uh, Enclosed came. And when speaking with, uh, with Yuko, she, she saw that there was a lot of resonance in what we, she was proposing for the Biennale. And so Enclosed came after a long research uh, that I started years ago and that I'm still, that is still ongoing about, you know, the, um, um, you said in your introduction that I was moving from history to more post-colonial and contemporary issues right now. And um, in my work, I started years ago uh, a very, very long research about monuments in, in, in Algeria. And most of them are from French heritage. They were all erected during French occupation. And uh, so after our independence in 62, we had to deal with this very heavy heritage and uh, how to how someone can reappropriate it or, uh, or refuse it or destroy it. Uh, so there were like thousands all over the country, thousands of artworks and uh, uh, like from the small, very little thing to the very monumental piece that is, uh, uh, so there is that is uh, erected in, uh, in the center of the city, like in Algiers or big cities like Oran or Constantine, etc. So uh, after independence, uh, most of them has been even vandalized or uh, destroyed or removed, and some of them has have been repurposed, re rearranged, or uh, and uh, what we see here in enclosed uh, is a very beautiful and unique monument history. What we see, if you can share, Aisha, or, sh or should I share? What do you prefer? Yes, please do. Sorry, there was a technical glitch. No, I will share it off. Just a sec. Disaster on Zoom. I'm back now. Thank you. Please do. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I will, I'll share a few pictures about the, 
this very unique history. I'm not sure. I didn't. I didn't encounter another story like this. It's let's say it's uh, it's like um, just one second. So you see, this is, um, do, you, do you see this picture? Is it working, the sharing? Not yet. Not yet? Yep, yep now. Now. Is it working? Yes. Yes, so this is Aisha. Okay, so this is the, what you see here is the, is the installation view is a documentary based installation where you have uh, archive you have um, I have staged all all my process all my process of, uh, of researching elements information and gathering all those things and uh, so there is in 28 uh, in Algiers in the center of Algiers French authorities uh, unveiled a very beautiful massive important uh, a monument dedicated to the to the dead. No, the, the one before Aisha. This one. Yeah, this one. This is the Pavois by Paul Landowski, a very great uh, French sculpture that won the contest for the erecting this monument. So this is a monument that was commemorating both Algerian and French soldiers that were that died in in the the First World War. They were unfortunately joined by other hundreds of names after the Second World War. And this very big high monument held center stage even after, after the independence. But um, so, so we kept it in our urban landscape and we, it was very easy to deal with it. It was absolutely accepted and it was not offending. And um, in 78, when Algeria was hosting the first Pan-African Games, the mayor of Algiers felt that this monument was not very well welcome in this in the urban landscape. So he decided to do something. So he, he commissioned our biggest uh, uh, modern art, uh, our biggest artist at the moment, uh, who is Mohamed Isyakhan, to do something with this. So right after, Isyakhan did something that is that I found really exceptional and very moving. So he did harm himself uh, and he did everything to just protect the monument. So he just like covered it in sort of cement, white cement. This is what we see today yeah? in sort of very in a small covering of white cement, very fragile, not not meant to last forever. And it was just to avoid destroying it. And I felt like uh, it was like he was giving us as a, as, as a future generation, maybe the responsibility to look after those it's not both monuments because he was not pretending he did another monument at his place. But when in 2012, I mean, right 50 years after the, the independence of Algeria, when you see that a crack appeared in this coffering, I felt that it, it was not like, it was like um, history wanted just like to knock on the door and say, hey, there is something that needs to happen. And all, all, all what you see here, all the front was collapsing. And at some point we were able to see both monuments, both gestures. And it was very moving because I felt like a third generation of artists to come and to deal with it and to, to intervene. And uh, what was it very interesting, it was to stage and to show this beautiful story. So if you, we can see the next, thank you. So this is now Mohamed Isyakhem, the Algerian, the Algerian um, artist that was trying to avoid, and you see just like very quick scaffoldings with wooden tubes and just like a small cement and he was covering it. And I felt that I had my generation, maybe other generations coming now, uh, have to impose themselves and pose a new narrative and maybe reappropriate this part of the story. Because you see this kind of memory nesting or this memory competition, let's say. It's just like a great metaphor, 
of Algerian French relationships until today, until, until the present. You know, it's just like always the untold, the unknown, always, um, you know, um, um, missed acts until, until today. Uh, even though we have a very strong relationships and uh, like five million Algerians living there, you can imagine in terms of uh, immigration and diaspora, uh, what is everyday links, what is everyday relationship between both, but still it's a very, very, um, how shall I say, very shameful past that we don't really know how to, how to really react. So this is the, this kind of memory competition, memory nesting, as I say, this double monument is like the real metaphor between both. At the same time, it is, um, you see in both the vitrines because the installation, well, I said is documentary based. I, I show both, um, uh, I, I have tried to put like Landowski and Sierra and both artists like di in a dialogue, in a, in a, in a, in a put together, put both works in echo, echoing, to, uh, echoing them. And uh, so you see here uh, on your left hand uh, um, uh, archive, you know, drawings and pictures and images and uh, from Landowski's archive in the Museum of the 30s in Paris. On the other hand, you can see um, the work of Isiachem, and maybe if you, if we can, if we can do a close up, yeah, this this is all the pieces. You know, what we see in uh, in Isiachem's work is that he, after he made this covering, this kind of box, closed box, he was trying to, let's say, decorate it with you know those two fists, like breaking the chains. Okay, yeah, because it's very sort of. Uh, we were, we were a very young, um, young independent country and that chose, you know, the socialist, socialism as a system. So even in our art, it was had, it was, it was supposed to be also, you know, socialist, realistic way. So you can see here, he was depicting, you know, the agrarian evolution with this, with this uh, tractor and this, uh, peasant revolution and uh, there is a banknote and a coin that Isyachem has has made uh, where he was still depicting this and uh, you know it's just like his life because he was a freedom fighter during the Algerian war for independence his life was totally like merging with Algerians uh, path you know with this uh, young nation, with this development, with all those political choices that, that were made. He was not like an official artist as maybe someone can consider. No, at all, he was really, it was really something else. It, it's interesting for me that with this work, I, of course, I'm revisiting history and politics, but I also revisit uh, art history in my country. And you can see in the next, uh, is in the next slide, so this is the, this, all those bits, this is the last remaining list of names that you see on your right hand side. But also, you know, if you can show the next one, Aisha, please. This is the reference, yeah, this, this triptych, this, this three series of three, of three uh, pictures that I made where where the, the, the monument collapsed. And at some point we could see behind the scaffoldings, we could see the Landowski emerging. From, and the title of this series is, uh, The Martyrs Are Returning This Week. This is a reference to the very, very famous novel that had been adapted to a play in the 70s, where one of our biggest uh, writers, which is, uh, who is, uh, Tahar Uttar was telling the story that all the martyrs of the revolution of the Algerian war were to come back to life and come to visit Algeria and see what happening. So everybody was just like freaking out, oh my God, the independent, the young independence is not like what it meant to be. So this was like a, it's like a kind of private joke in Algeria. It's just like, a, oh, what do you mean? Oh, is it the martyr returning this week? It's something that we use very often. This is why the, the title of this series is that. So you see that I was trying to find links, this kind of, um, back and forth between history and art history and also literature. And uh, this is the whole piece, this is the background. Uh, because the background, I told you, I'm, I'm totally into um, inner city girl, I love. 
urbanity, I love the language, the metaphors of architecture uh, that I very often use in my work. And what you see here, here in your right hand side is um, the drawing that I call studies. And studies is um, here in my work very often because I work on the public space and the public uh, space in Algeria is very, very, um, how shall I, it's not, it's not banned, it's very complicated, let's say, in, in, impeached and, and it's, um, so very often I give voice, I give voice to, to people, to, to all, to, to, to people, to artists, uh, I, 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 I listen to their, to their, how shall I say, to their concern also, and I try to be in to that kind of transmission. So what I see, what we see here in the drawing is that people were considering that we were we're not allowed, we're not obliged anymore to hide. Maybe we can we can show both. Maybe we can do like half half. We maybe this is a story. This is a beautiful story. And now we we we're not like kids that couldn't face reality. We don't have to. I mean to hide. Maybe now this is time to open the shell. And maybe now we can we can see it. But unfortunately, it has been renovated and closed for a maybe another generation has been like i mean the se the shell has been renovated not the not the not the genuine not the uh, so this is like a, a a new a new a new page a new white page and we have to rewrite on it so this is the story of enclosed thank you so much and i'm sure it doesn't escape anyone watching the the relevance of this project in the current context thinking yeah. about monuments and you you were also um, you were also telling me uh, about if it was ongoing or not, uh, Aisha. Exactly. Yes, I have developed the project, mm -hmm. and there is a publication that accompanies it. Um, I mean, all this material and all this story. Now, it, it there is a new iteration of the project, which is a lecture performance where I perform my own voices and Landowski voices and I, I'm, I'm retelling this story. And there is also a publication, maybe you can see it, you know, it's a handmade publication, you know, with archive, with uh, true and false and uh, yeah, because I'm staging my voice and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm retelling how I was like a detective gathering small information because in Algeria, it's very, very complicated to get information. This is why I'm telling them. These are the links that I'm trying to every day to draw. And there are links I think that, that resonates with, with all of us um, as well, you know, just thinking in terms of monuments, thinking in terms of there was something you, you said about the responsibility as mm. well of choosing uh, what we do with our histories and, and there being something very beautiful about that um, and, and bringing that story as well to, to represent this. Um, I am going to now address my next question to Omar, um, because I'm aware that we are, uh, our conversations are too good, <laughs> and I'm, I'm just keeping a, a track on, on where we are for time. Omar is actually about to give us a presentation, um, and b before I move on from you, Amina, I just wanted to say also, uh, thinking in terms of these March meetings, and uh, the context for the next biennial, thinking historically present. Um, it, you've left us really with something uh, thinking historically present, uh, reflecting on that work from a few years ago, that's even more uh, pertinent today perhaps. Um, so Omar, if I can hand over to you, I'll, I think your share screen is, is working to start the presentation. Yes, uh, one second. It's it's working, but it's not showing. One second. Is it showing? No, it's not. Wait. Okay. So I'll, I'll play. I, I'll play this in a sec. I'll talk about this in a second. But first, I just wanted to take a moment to say that. Um, um, how despondent I am that we're not physically together. I know some of us have been privileged enough to have the first dose of a vaccine, which, you know, we're sitting here um, in isolation more than a year later. Last year, I was in the, we, we were meant to have this conversation live in the March meeting. 
and all of a sudden everything was pulled and I was I remember being in Sharjah in what was the most terrifying I had literally just moved to Sharjah properly like got my apartment furnished it everything unpacked my suitcases and boom everything shut down can't leave the house and alone and that was an incredibly interesting thing and here we are a year later all a step closer but i just wanted to say that um it, how much of a privilege it is to even though we can't be together to to to, to say thank you to all of you uh, for being who you are um i have to pay homage to all of you in different ways so john Comfra, um i've been kind of chasing my whole life um in 2007 there was a show called the ghost of songs at fact in Liverpool, which is where I got my first job as full curator two years after that show. It was a show uh, curated by the Ottoliffe Collective in that instance, I suppose, because it's the collective and the group, the collective do the curatorial. And it was mesmerizing and magnificent and life-changing. And um, uh, Jean Fisher, who wrote an essay for that book, would end up becoming the mentor who would shape the the rest of my professional life until her passing in 2016 and um and then in 2012 when the unfinished conversation was part of the liverpool biennial i was an associate curator of that biennial and i really was hoping that i would be able to be in your orbit but i wasn't allowed on that project so i, I couldn't get on that project and so then i remember seeing it again Sharjah and I thought I'd meet John and Sharjah. I didn't get to meet John and Sharjah. Now that I work for the foundation, um, where it's, it's important to mention that John's relationship with Sharjah Art Foundation extends beyond just the SB11, uh, but also uh, two of his major works um, uh, for Nocturnes and African Soldier Mimesis were filmed in Sharjah, uh, at least in part. Uh, and um, uh, uh, I had the privilege to work with her to um, bring those works into the Sharjah Art Foundation collection. Um, but still, we haven't sat down and had that 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 free flowing, uh, a comfort time conversation that I'm really praying for. Um, so I'm hoping that it will happen. Um, and then um, Unji, I just wanted to, Unji to know that. I, so I had heard about Unji through a former colleague of hers, uh, Lauren Cornell, um, uh, this, this, this fierce colleague of her she had mentioned that I had to meet. Um, uh, and, um, I rem and the first time I, I saw Unji was on stage at, at March meeting 2012, giving, I had never seen someone give William Wells like really dig into William Wells and ask him those difficult questions. And I was like, whoa, wow, she is afraid of nothing. She can take on everything. I had actually, and I had seen the ungovernables actually, which was the that year or the year, year preceding, I can't remember exactly, not knowing it was, was Unji's show that she'd curated that show. Uh, and it had it brought to America, you know, the first like real in-depth look of, look of many young artists like Adrian Belarochas and uh, a, a re-look at Lenecdia um, Don Boache, many artists who actually featured in in um, in Unji's Biennial, but also Unji spoke of something in an, a separate talk called Night School that you'd run um, at, at, at um, the New Museum. And actually Night School, I've, I've never told anyone this, was a kind of informal inspiration for a program that I ran called We Are Here, where I was given basically this uh, building for a year uh, on the edge of the Queen Elizabeth Olympic, Olympic Park in 2012-13. And I ran residencies and events kind of inspired by um, the, the, the form and shape uh, that Unji had talked about in, in that presentation. And it led to the publication, You Are Here, which was is to date my, my best-selling book, Art After the Internet, which is kind of, um, so you should know the influence of your, of your ways, of your, of your, of your, of your of your hard work and efforts in, in my world, because I don't articulate those. And, and Amina, I also am deeply, deeply um, moved by the fact that you continue 
to persevere in a context that I know very well in Algeria is so difficult to be able to gather and galvanize information. I have been uh, delighted that we are work been working recently to um, bring your work into the Charge Art Foundation collection. And then, and Aisha, of course, getting to know you through this process, your generosity, your, your, your spirit and your patience, thank you. And Autobong, I mean, I, I mean, there are no words you are, um, the the uh, you affirm you affirm you affirm my right to self-identify uh, in whichever way I please being a child of the diaspora people ask me where I'm from um, whether I'm from South LA or whether I'm from um, from Shoreditch or Glasgow or Cairo or Sudan or wherever it is that I am from um, you say, you know what, does it, you, you, you be you. And um, that spirit is actually what I'm gonna talk about now, which is uh, in some ways about a decolonizing process around exhibition making, which is about Charge of Banyan 14. And I wanna just take a second to say, um, Claire, I'm, I feel like I haven't consulted my um, co-curators of SB 14, but I hope that I, I, I give some, some justice, although this is, to, to that process, but essentially, what I'm what I'm gonna do where is just play where is this play button? Um, it will it will it it will work. Excuse me. Yep. So, if you don't mind, if I read, uh, so Sharjah Biennial fourteen began as most of these events do as an invitation. It was a summoning of sorts to receive the call. <clears throat> a reckoning with myself and my culture. I had spent more than a decade at that point working at warp speed, fighting through excruciating physical and psychological pain in Western institutions, perhaps foolishly wanting to be seen. In 2010, my mentor, the late professor Jean Fisher, professed that I needed to find my own people. She argued that I had to keep, I had to stop aspiring to curating mimetic forms, and these are her words, and to reconnect with my home. I never argued back that being diasporic was the home I liked most. She sent off a number of emails introducing me to people who would become interlocutors over the years that would follow, even if even for fleeting moments. Of them were artist and writer Kemal Bullata, the late curator Okwian Wazer, and SAF's president Hul Kasimi. She had asked if asked her if I could present my PhD thesis in progress at the March meeting. I never had the heart to let Jean know that the email to Hur had bounced back. Instead, I applied for an open call to speak at the March meeting, which begun an obsession of Sharjah. When I arrived, Sharjah presented a realm of possibilities and, and encounters unlike any other I had experienced. As Soha Shuman, founder of Darat al Funun, mentioned yesterday, Sharjah Biennial, and in turn the foundation, is a success story of the most epic proportions. In Egypt and the rest of the African continent where I was living at the time, with all of its mythologies of delayed modernity, of, um, actually, yeah, delayed modernity is a Western, is a, is a Western notion. Let's just call it of, of so-called modernities. I had never been witness to anything like this. I returned to Sharjah every year without fail from then on. The route to Sharjah Biennial 14 was unique among, among the Sharjah Biennials that we've heard about so far. Hurul Kasami and her team had convened three curators without any hierarchy. Zoe Butt and Claire Tancon were invited, along with myself, to construct the form of the biennial. We gathered in Sharjah a matter of weeks after the invitation. In those days, the three of us, all from uniquely situated contexts, spent day and night together, exceptional to any collaborative experience between strangers that I had had. We all came to the table raw and unguarded, hearts on sleeves. Over the course of that time, we monologued, dialogued, argued, 
laughed and may have even cried. And you can guess who it was that cried. Um, that's me, yeah. I should make evident that this account of events is wholly derived from my own memory, of which some accuse me that there are lapses. Um, any error, errors or misrepresentations are my own. I would say that collectively, as diasporic citizens, the three of us, we were tense about the, about the notion of Western modernity. It unsettled us and fired us up, so to speak, because we were frustrated with the systemic injustice that affected the lives of artists in particular. We were concerned with their violent, often traumatic lived experiences. Equally, we were profoundly critical of the manner in which certain Western institutions, namely museums, had sought to absorb the work of particular practitioners as a balm, a tonic, a token. Okwian Weiser's essay from 2008, The Postcolonial Constellation, which forms one of the theoretical backbones to the current exhibition in the Flying Saucer. Yes, that's a plug for a show I've curated called Unsettled Objects, um, became a point of discussion. We did not yet know that Okwi was to be invited as the curator of the next biennial, but this fact speaks to his enduring influence on all of us. In this essay, Inwazer argued that the West's obsession of global contemporaneity was only skin deep. That's, those are my words. He beckoned for a re-examination of a global modern, something arguably you could have seen, I believe Unju was talking about, with showing the works of Salwa Shu'er and others, Fahrnes Azid in SB12, constructed outside of the violent field of Eurocentric modernity invoking the concept of epistemic violence that, that this had created for generations of artists and scholars. By returning to and sketching out a global modern, we could imagine a possible future. Ariella Aisha Azule, whose manuscript was not yet published at the time, evolves these thoughts in her book, Potential History, where she pivots in and around a manifesto to unlearn imperialism libraries, archives, museums, and so much more are anchored around an imperial epistemic structure that requires reimagining. This leads us to the world that we have been discussing today of collective affinities, informal networks that help us see ourselves and others. And that is indeed what my work is concerned with and what all of our work was concerned with is how is it that we are seen and how do we want to be seen? And when we say us, we are also talking about the artists of which we are representing. These networks are not simply revelatory, but protective networks. And the notion of protective is key here. Through sharing experience, we can guard each other from exploitation. Perhaps in the Q&A we can talk about another example of exploitation. Leaving the echo chamber emerged as a joint act of collective weaving. We each took a piece of a large tapestry and worked our way to its core. It was never intended as free independent projects. Rather, we conceived of the framework collectively, discussing cybernetics, al algorithmic culture, state hegemony, Western imperialism, and ultimately human volatility. The biennial team directed us when the practicalities of our intense day jobs dispersed us from one another. Yet each of us was responding to the sum total of a singular idea. In Journey Beyond the Arrow, Zoe Butt created a toolkit for the movement of humanity, arguing for the necessity of exchange. Clara Tankin explored migrant images and fugitive forms in a panoptical exploration of the body perceived across history in Look For Me All Around You. I wanted to slow down to experience the experience in making new time. The venues across the Emirate were interwoven, 
as were the stories they told, be they resonant or dissonant. Each so-called platform was an archipelago to invoke the Martinician writer, Edouard Glissant, that creolized each other. One of the privileges of working on the Sharjah Biennial is the process of commissioning, of responding to sight, but also to creating art that is wholly situated in the social, political, and economic context of the Emirate. Ottobong Otto Nkanga was incidentally one of the last artists that I invited. I was working with her on a major museum survey and did not want to overwhelm her initially until that process was completed. Expecting she would ex accept my invitation, I had held a spot for her, a ruin of sorts, Beit al Abudi. The decision was intuitive. The work, aging ruin, dreaming only to recall the hard chisel of the past, that's a poem in its own right, became the first site-specific installation from Sharjah Biennial to remain on permanent display. It also won the main prize at the Biennial that year. The journey to making this work began without a shape. Otto Bong and I did not discuss curatorial concepts or themes at all. Rather, we walked up and down this very souk between the arts area to Al Marija Square, pacing back and forth, exchanging thoughts about the changing makeup of the shops, the opening up of a posh hotel at the edge. Nakanga was a veteran of Sharjah, having been an SB7 in 2005 and SB11 in 2013. Violence, racism, poetry, lyric, illness. Those were the topics that we discussed. And those were the topics that fueled endless hours, days, and months of conversation. I trusted Ottobong, and I do, implicitly with every decision that she made. I was a very gentle sounding board. The project was emblematic of a specific duality one that revolved around the caring for one another when the other needed it. Care, I realized, was a two-way street. Not just for, for and of the artist, as we were taught as curators, but also caring for the curator. The resulting project, which was produced for relatively modest means, could not have been realized in my belief belief without our love, friendship, and compassion for one another. An experience that emerged from having worked intensely side by side before, having survived a collective struggle and a trauma together. Speaking from our current vantage point, I believe that the duty of care of one another, of artists, of curators, of all of our colleagues, every single one of them, of our multiple publics, is the most crucial prerequisite act for our field to stay alive. Thank you. Omar, thank you so much for that very, very beautiful presentation. Um, and I, I think I'm actually going to ask Otto Bung to, to, to now present immediately because your, your relationship both artistically and on a personal level is, is so uh, clear and so tangible. And I know that she wants to immediately speak about uh, that work and her experience of making it with you and um, the very strong reactions that it elicited in the community as well. Um, so please, also, um, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Okay, I'm quite emotional at this point in time. So my voice might be a bit crackly, um, but I would love to thank you all and 
thank you know um, the whole team of March meeting. We were meant to have it last year. And with all what's going on, it's been pushed onto this year. So I was hoping to actually come back to Sharjah. Um, and I was hoping to be able to see everybody and it hasn't been the case, but we're seeing each other here. But the just being here with each person and each one of you, and I think I know each one of you. So it makes it a very emotional um, moment and to listen to all what has happened over time um, in Sharjah and to observe it from 2005 till now has been one of the greatest privileges I've had. I could talk about the light that has changed in Sharjah um, or in Dubai or in the Emirates when we arrived, when I arrived in 2005, there was a special light a light that was due to the cranes and all the construction material structures in place um, to the people and the amount of people that would be on the streets um, to the kinds of shops that you would see and how that has changed. And I think those were the conversations we talked about or I talked with with Omar and how the shipping and the shifting of the atmosphere, the economy, um, the politics of the space has happened. Um, and so it, it was a very emotional time to just walk with the curator or the person or the human being that you are working with. And it seemed like the title or the topic of the exhibition did not make sense for me to be talking about, but it made sense to talk about just the reality and what that space evokes and to show your own vision of the space itself. So um, yeah, with Omar, it's been a very long journey. We met in 2015 and we've continued this conversation and we continue it till, you know, we keep on continuing the conversation. And we've been through many experiences, the heat of Sharjah, um, traveling through the landscapes, going to Fujairah mountains, moving to Kalba, um, you know, the um, Al Madam, the, all the different spaces we shared together and moved through space and talked about possibilities. But I think with regards to this project, I felt like after this was the third time I was being invited to Sharjah and I felt like, oh gosh, I don't think I'll be able to do this alone. And I told Umar that I would love to invite um, Emeka Obo um, and to be able to work on this piece. And, um, but I had many ideas and the different ideas started with digging a hole in the ground and being the and having the body in the ground and listening to the earth and making a sound piece that will connect around water, soil, body, and also smell the earth. Um, and then it shifted into um, thinking about the light, the sun. Um, and then by the time Emeka visited and he came back, he was thinking about the singing of the kids or singing about rainwater. And, but before then I was, had been to Senegal and in Senegal I'd visited the salt pans. And uh, there's something funny about, or something interesting about Sharjah and that I think in the, in, when I was doing my performance in 2013 for the S Sharjah Biennale 11 was a way of connecting other spaces to Sharjah. And what Sharjah does to me is a very physical and visceral kind of effect in that sense. Um, I see many other cities in Sharjah. Um, and I think because it's been built by many people coming from many places and that touch, even though there is a certain design, but you feel that there is that connection with Asia, there is that connection with Africa, and there is even a connection with um, the islands, with Brazil. And for me, that made sense to think through those interconnections. So being in, in Senegal and visiting the Sine Saloum region and seeing all the salt pans brought me back to the idea of salination in the Emirates and how certain wells become so filled with salt that you can't drink the water. And just thinking about the time of transformation, I think Ojin, um, Uji, um, 
Unji talks about deep time, talks about standing in the, in the sand, in the desert and understanding it was sea, that you would see the shell. And that is the evidence and the witness of time. And um, that notion of witness, the witness, the material that becomes witness, the material that talks about time was interesting and important for me. So in relation to thinking about the project, um, I was thinking about the sunset, the light that, you know, the, the, and to create a tonal um, work that would open up that space of time, light and sound. But I think maybe it's good for me to share my screen to be able to just show the work itself. And um, here, so I would do this. Um, and when I visited the site with Omar, I think one of the things that really touched me was the partial dryness. So this was the, the, the image I took when I was there. You could see the trees growing and also at the same time, this dead palm tree. And I kind of felt this strong emotion towards the palm tree. I hugged the palm tree and I looked at it as a being, a being that had lost life. And I started asking the question, the most essential question, what happened to you? What, what, what made you become this way? Because the trees around the palm tree were still alive, they were still green. Um, and then that was the way I started thinking about the space. What is happening underneath? What is the thing that is not visible, that is not tangible, but only manifests itself through death, but still around it, there is life. So there was this thing of the duality of birth and something that could be born again and something that is dying. And to think through that in relation to also the kind of landscape that is expansive within the Emirates and also in different parts of the world. So that interconnection with Senegal or like the brine, the water, the pans, the salts, the water changing slowly without us realizing into um, salt water from soft water into salt. And so it started bringing up these ideas. And then Emeka had the idea that, wow, why don't we, why don't, he is interested in rain. He's interested in bringing in that idea of kids singing, like how we used to sing as kids, rain, rain, go away, na, 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 come again. Na, na, na. And so he was wondering like, okay, in the Emirates, how would the kids sing for the rain to come back? And I was from my side thinking about, water, rain, brine, and thinking about ways in which those two could then connect. And I had to find a way that my, the, the tree would have its own life. We'll talk about its addiction to salt. We'll talk about the life underneath its pain. We'll talk about rebirth. We'll talk about addiction, addiction to salt. We'll talk about love and how that would connect to being human in a way. And so I would continue the um, imagery so you'd see what happened at the end. Um, so we made the salt pans that will contain the, the water and different tones and glows, like, you know, different colors um, that reflect around brine or let's say pans. Um, that have algae and, and those algae would change the color of the water. And here we had the water seeping into the part of the construction around the craters and you'd have the residues of the salt. We got, um, you'd have the residues of the salt around the pan. So what you see, the white is actually that. And we used all the different rooms in the space to have different little craters. And the other rooms on the other side, we had um, um, light boxes. So the way of thinking about the light box, I was interested in thinking through a work that could shift from daytime into nighttime. So during, as the sun will set, the tone and the colors of the sun and the, uh, uh, of the, yeah, of the sun will then appear, um, of the shift of tones of the transition from day to night. And the sound piece, we had a six channel sound piece in the space that will actually um, were layered voices that I recorded in the studio. So I recorded a three for three days, um, a whole layering of 
the sound and stories of the tree, um, the, the, the gargling of the water, um, the stories around the landscape, the shift of the landscape, the story of being in love. And I was interested in that notion of the layering and completely breaking and fragmenting the different stories together and allowing for each corner you pass and you walk in the space would open up a different kind of world. Um, and so, and at the same time, to find the title of the work was a poem I wrote, which is Aging Ruins, only to recall the hard chisel from the past. And I felt like that title or that poem kind of resonated and talked about the chiseling. And when we talk about history, um, it's also a certain way for me of almost sculpting. I see it as a sculpture, as a way that we are sculpting different kinds of shapes and forms in which we can go back to and look at. And then we try to analyze what kind of tools were used during a specific time and how that shifted. I think one of the things I was, I'm, I'm interested in is, for example, I visited at one point in time, um, a space in Bolzano going into the marble, like say they're going into a, a quarry and in that quarry, you could actually see the, 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 the kinds of tools that were used at different periods in history to excavate and take out um, marble. And you could see there are different um, kind of um, residues or let's say traces of this material. So you would see how the technology shifted through the traces on the marble itself. And so for me, it was interesting to think about that as a way of um, this work as how the residue of the salt or the residue of the dead tree becomes also a part of a history and becomes the witness of a space and time. So what I will do here will be to share with you a sound, a part of the sound piece. And um, so I'll just play it now and um, we can listen to that. And this is the sound piece that will be coming um, that will be in the LP that will be coming out in the fall. Um, and it's an LP that is connected to this work. So here we go. from many directions. We have sipped into the world and flooded it. We are everywhere, around him and across we are in part of it. Turning the world slowly into salty fields. Pans, spans along the surface. You take parts of me, you sip it, you swallow, you goggle. Gaggle, 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 slowly salting each drain and veins, and slowly you get in waste and waste numb. As you stand there looking down in the surface, a reflection of your skin on my skin. Ways to bend, ways to flow, ways to float. As you lay slowly, sitting, thinking, pondering, wondering, what next? Ways to train, ways to soar, ways to fall, ways to wake. The light blinks faintly, lamely, breathing on each other. You take a part of me and I take a part of you. The lights glistening on my softness slowly. As night falls, as dusk begins, sweat out slowly, we wake. Get the salt and sweat. More slowly, we become. 
become something else that the sun evaporates and takes away the humidity that lays within our skin. Dryness installs. Dryness comes close. Dryness to sit and crack. As the light blinks, faintly, lamely breathing each other, we lay. Ways to prime, ways to pan, ways to fall, ways you blow and ways you wake. Slowly to the salty fields that span. I knew you liked me. How could it have gone so bad? So I dug my roots deep into your crater. What happened to us? It served as an anchor to my soul. I anchored to you deeply. What happened? I gathered your waters and ate your nutrients that you gave me. Not possible. And the nutrients transferred to the rings of my trunk. We stood in years. Gone. I thought I would even reproduce even more. Nothing is left. I was without defense. Wasted years. It is very hard to tell him the story to you. I was beyond survival. It's almost impossible to tell the story without feeling such strong emotions. The energy stored inside of me was so strong. <laughs> Excuse me, one second. I have to catch my breath. And now it felt like we were one together in this place. It was good for me. It felt like we would live forever. Strongly together. I realized that we had something. But now it's not possible. They don't even exist. I don't lose my leaves blew to the wind for you. My bark fell on you once in a while, so you would suck in it and love it. Even my palm dropped within your water. I thought it was love, but you strangled me. Love. I was told it was a disease. You strangled every single ring around my ring. A disease that you even forgot from where you come from. I thought it was love. I drank even more. At least the sun still shines. I believed you because I knew that we had love and we shared it every day. That is one thing I know. Slowly my roots became tired. My memory is going of what I used to be. Of course you forget me. It's only the children that tell me what it is. They told me I used to enjoy the rain. Told me that when it drizzled and the wind blew, my 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 leaves would actually shiver. We will just stand here together and live our lives separately. I sipping from you, and you drying away.
Thank you. Atabang, thank you so much. Um, and and if I can just say, it's it's very rare in the current climate to be able to experience meaningful art. <laughs> um, so thank you have for having shared that with us today. So we're also able to to have experienced this. Um, we have um, just about five minutes left now. Um, there was a lot of space that we all wanted for Q and A. I should mention to the audience that um, there's a breakout session after this where some of the panelists will be. Um, so please do join for that um, as well if you're able to. Um, but uh, I, I'll address the final question very briefly to Autobahn. This was a question for all the panelists, but it was following after seeing that work. Um, and it's from Antonia Carver, who said, mm -hmm. uh, material as witness to time is so beautiful. Thank you, Autobahn. I wonder if the panelists, or in this case you, um, could reflect on how the biennials and their works layer memory over time. In what ways can you feel works under works and how do they impact the UAE over decades? Hmm. Gosh, <laughs> that's quite a, a, an intense question. Um, I remember in 2005, um, the way the works were shown were mainly in the old, um, in the old museum, in the museum itself, and well, in each corner, and you had to walk up the ramp to be able to see works. Um, and I think what Shaja has done in relation to exhibitions, but not only exhibitions, but I think the meeting of people from different parts of the world, um, meeting people from Southeast Asia, from Asia, from Korea, from, you know, I met Shimabuku in 2005. Um, and you meet, um, you meet um, Masya Kure, uh, you meet uh, Hanawa, Abo, um, Hanawa Haloba, you meet many kinds of people working from different ranges. Um, and I feel that what it's done over time has been to connect people in one way, but also to see how um, the thinking process of artists and also to understand, I think, also a politics of the space and the society. And I, those are very crucial things in, especially when you're doing biennials in places that do not work or do not respond or do not, are not functioning as it is in the West or not functioning as it is within the African continent, but it, or within Asia, or, but it's functioning in a way that it's opening up a kind of way of understanding that it's a melting pot for different kinds of people that come into a place and to work and to earn money and to live. So you understand it on many complex levels. I think that was the first time for me in 2005 where I saw works and also meeting all kinds of people, but also understanding the political climate of a place and the shifting of an economy of a place. Um, and, and I think that resonates. I mean, when I look at 2005 Biennale into, for example, 2013, when I came back with Yuko Hasagewa, um, and then you realize that the work has even now entered into the public space, the public domain. Um, we talked earlier on about Superflex, but I'll also mention someone like Ernesto Neto. Um, you see some a work where you would have, you have to take the boat to, and then you experience having an ice cream on the boat while going to another part of Sharjah. And, and now in 2000 and, um, uh, 2019, we now see that extension of the Biennale beyond just the main charge, but entering into all the other um, um, other places like in um, Al Madam, uh, the Kalba space, and you see that it's kind of like having extensions and looking at its provinces or like it's still Shaja, but looking at the way it, the, the, the geographies of the space to also extend art into many other places. So for me, I think just that shift is very, has been very important. And the meeting of artists among ourselves have been super important too. I hope I answered the question. 
Thank you for answering it also. I am aware I gave you a limited <laughs> time frame for it. Um, but, but that note you ended on, on, on this being a meeting place, um, I know that uh, we were all supposed to be in person, but it was truly a privilege uh, to be able to spend these hours with you today. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, to thank each of you so much for participating, for the audience, for being with us, and the fantastic uh, team at the Sharjah Art Foundation for putting this together. If I, if I wasn't aware of the time, I would be very happy to spend another two hours uh, <laughs> with you all at the very least. Um, so with this, uh, I'm closing uh, the panel, but please do join us for breakout sessions and hopefully we will see each other next year at the 13th edition of the March meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Everybody.